afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Serqua from the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services and will be your moderator for today. Welcome to our presentation of EM 3590, the severe winter storm and snowstorm. Please note that your phones and computers have been muted and will remain so during the entire presentation. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will have a Q&A portion later in the presentation where we will answer them. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Patricia Debley, who will be giving the presentation this afternoon. Hello and welcome to the applicant briefing for EM 3590, the Federal Disaster Emergency Declaration for the damages caused by the severe winter storm and snowstorm. My name is Patricia Debley. I am with the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, or more commonly referred to by the acronym DHSES, pronounced DISHES. This presentation and the narrative is posted on the DISHES website shown on this slide. We will be po posting other pertinent information as it develops, so we urge you to visit the website frequently and take advantage of the information posted there. We have a lot of very important information to pass along to you today, so please mute your phones and laptops so that we can cover the material and everyone can hear the presentation. The federal government assigns a disaster number to every federally declared emergency, and the number for this New York emergency is EM3590. Please note that this emergency declaration, EM3590, is for the winter storm that began on December 23rd, 2022. It is a new declaration. There are some very important regulatory, de regulatory deadlines that must be met by applicants. Many of these deadlines are triggered by the declaration date. For EM3590, that date is December 26, 2022. We, were we will cover these deadlines later in this presentation. The incident period for EM3590 is December 23rd and continuing. FEMA will set an end date and we'll advise when that date is set, which means that all damages must have occurred on those dates and be a direct result of the severe winter storm in order to be considered for eligibility by FEMA. In addition, certain emergency protective measures taken in anticipation of the storm may be eligible even if they were performed prior to the incident period. The federal cost share is set at 75%, which means applicants will incur a 25% local cost share on their projects. While in many past disasters, the state has picked up a portion of the local share, this decision has not been made at this time. The FEMA Public Assistance Program and Policy Guide, commonly referred to as the Papa G, is in effect, or in effect for EM3590 is version four. Papa G version four can be found on the FEMA.gov website, the DISHES website, and in the resources tab of the grants portal once you are approved as an applicant. This slide shows the key personnel assigned to manage EM3590. Lai Sun Yi has been assigned as the federal coordinating officer. DISHES commissioner Jackie Bray is the governor's authorized representative and state coordinating officer. DISH's Deputy Director of Recovery Programs, Rihanna Gonzalez, is the Alternate Governor's Authorized Representative and Deputy State Coordinating Officer, and Bernadette Moran is the Dis Disaster Assistance Manager. EM3590 is currently only declared for Erie and Genesee counties. However, we can request to add additional counties if circumstances warrant. Only applicants in declared counties are potentially eligible in EM3590. What is public assistance? The key is to remember that the FEMA Public Assistance Program is a reimbursement program that provides financial assistance to eligible applicants recovering from the impact of the declared event. The December 2022 winter storm proper documentation of the work performed will be crucial to an effective and timely reimbursement process. This slide shows the FEMA public assistance process steps. We are now in the applicant briefing phase and will cover the remaining process steps in this presentation. The submission of the request for public assistance or RPA is one of the most important steps for applicants. The deadline for potential applicants 
for EM 3590 Two Dishes ends on January 20th, 2023. FEMA will deny late submissions unless the applicant and the state can clearly show that it was due to circumstances beyond their control. Simply stating that a key person was on vacation or you were occupied with other issues will not be sufficient and FEMA does and will continue to deny late RPAs. We encourage you to act immediately on this requirement. The RPA packets for both governmental and private not-for-profit entities are available on our website. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact us immediately. Once your RPA is approved, you should immediately begin preparing your damage inventory if you have not already done so. FEMA will assign a program delivery manager and DISHES will assign a state disaster assistance representative to assist and guide you through the process. The first contact after the RPA approval will be the exploratory call. This introductory call is designed to identify the applicant's damages and needs and to schedule the recovery scoping meeting. During the RSM, the state and the applicant will review the applicant's damage inventory and start formulating the damages into logical projects. The recovery scoping meeting starts the 60-day clock for the applicant to formally identify all damages to FEMA. It is critical that all damages be identified and recorded on the applicant's damage inventory within this 60-day period, as the grants portal will automatically lock the applicant out after that date. If there are valid reasons that preclude the identification of all damages, such as inaccessible damage sites, you must notify your FEMA state team immediately so arrangements can be made to assess those sites as soon as possible. Please be aware that oversights, competing priorities, staff turnover, and poor record keeping or other circumstances within the applicant's control generally will not justify the addition of damages identified after the 60-day window has expired. Applicants should already be undertaking a comprehensive survey of the damages and costs they incurred as a result of this disaster. FEMA's goal is to conduct, conduct the exploratory, exploratory call within seven days of assigning a program delivery manager and to conduct the recovery scoping meeting within 21 days of the exploratory call. The deadline to identify all damages within 60 days of the recovery scoping meeting is a hard deadline and failure to meet it may result in damages that were identified late being denied. We will now cover eligibility criteria for EM 3590. This pyramid shows the tiers of eligibility. All four tiers must be eligible in order to obtain FEMA funding. We will cover all of these starting with the bottom tier, eligible applicants. This slide shows the types of eligible applicants under the FEMA Public Assistance Program and should help you ident identify which category your organization falls into. State, local, and tribal applicants require only basic documentation to file their RPA. For private nonprofit organizations commonly referred to as PNPs, FEMA requires additional documentation, and we will cover those requirements later in this presentation. To begin with, PNPs must also provide documentation that shows that they own or operate an eligible facility where eligible services are performed within a declared county in order to be an eligible applicant. This slide shows the minimum required documentation that must accompany the RPA packet for all private nonprofit applicants. Applicants must identify the eligible services provided at their facility. Eligible PNP services are listed in the Papa G version four. FEMA may also ask for additional information if they deem it necessary to decide the applicant's eligibility. The next tier of eligibility is the facility. Facility is defined as any publicly or PNP owned building, works, system, or equipment, or certain improved and maintained natural features. Unimproved areas such as fields or natural stream banks are not eligible. In order to be eligible, the facility must be the legal responsibility of the applicant, have damages caused by the December winter storm, be in use at the time of the disaster and not under the authority of another federal agency. For FHWA roads, however, FEMA will cover eligible emergency protective measures. For a PNP facility to be eligible, the facility must have been in use for the eligible purpose at the time of the declared event. For EM 3590, most costs will be eligible emergency protective measures necessary to ensure public safety. 
For work to be eligible for the FEMA PA program, it must be required as a direct result of the declared emergency. The legal responsibility of an eligible applicant located in a declared county needed within regulatory timeframes. Declarations for snow are severely limited in type of work. EM 3590 does not include snow assistance. Routine plowing of roads and streets is also not authorized. No removal plowing is only authorized when it is reasonable and necessary to perform other eligible emergency protective measures. For example, to clear the snow to repair a down power line or to get fire apparatus to report a building fire, for emergency medical needs or for search and rescue when stranded motorists have been reported. This slide shows another significant deadline that is initially triggered by the declaration date. Deadlines for completing the work on an approved project. For emergency work, applicants have six months from the declaration date to complete the approved scope of work. New York State can grant an additional six month extension for a total of 12 months from the declaration date. This declaration does not include permanent work categories. Damages to infrastructure caused by the performance of eligible emergency work can be included in the CAT B project. This slide shows the categories of work under the FEMA PA program. As you can see, they are broken into two major categories, emergency work categories A and B, and permanent work categories C through G. EM 3590 authorized only category B emergency protective measures. Category B emergency protective measures are measures taken before, during, and after an event that save lives protect public health and safety, or eliminate an, immediately, an immediate threat or significant damage to improve public and private property. Examples of such measures are shown on the slide. As previously mentioned, normal plowing of roads is not eligible. Plowing in order to perform an eligible emergency protective measure, such as plowing to get fire apparatus to a building fire, or rescuing an individual stranded by the snow would be eligible. Under Papa G version 4, FEMA will now consider the time the applicant is taking to resolve the immediate threat when evaluating whether the measure is eligible for reimbursement. Please take this into account when planning your emergency protective measures as unnecessary delays may jeopardize your reimbursement. FEMA program and policy guide Papa G version 4 contains detailed information on work eligibility. This slide shows the normal eligible cost for a severe winter storm declaration. EM 3590 does not authorize snow assistance, except when necessary and reasonable to perform other eligible emergency work. Permanent work damages caused by the storm, such as a collapsed roof due to snow weight or equipment damages while performing eligible work are not due to negligence or not due to negligence may also be eligible. Again, normal plowing of roads is not considered an eligible expense. If you encounter a cost that is not listed or are unsure, please reach out to the recovery point of contact listed later in this presentation for additional guidance. All claimed expenses need to be fully documented. This slide shows some of the required documentation. Sheltering costs are only eligible if the shelter is used. If you have other costs not listed and have questions, please reach out to us for guidance. If you incur damages while performing eligible work, make sure you document the date, time, location, damage description and cause, work being performed and the cost estimate. As we mentioned, there may be occasions where storm damages to permanent type work occur. In these cases, that work may be eligible. In addition, damages caused by the performance of eligible work that are not attributable to negligence, faulty equipment or operator error may be eligible and may be included in the CAP-B Emergency Protective Measures Project. If you have such damages, please reach out to our staff for guidance. FEMA Environmental and Historic Preservation Specialists perform compliance reviews on all projects to ascertain whether the applicant has met applicable federal environmental and historical preservation laws, policies, and executive orders. Applicants must obtain all required permits for their projects from the appropriate regulatory agencies, which may involve the United States Army Corps of Engineers, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and other agencies. Please pay particular attention 
to these requirements as FEMA can deny funding on your project for non-compliance. Again, if you're not sure about what you can or cannot do, please ask for guidance before you act. Applicants must comply with both federal and state legal requirements. While some state requirements, such as the State Environmental Quality Review Act or CEQA requirement mandate certain procedures, they are not identical to federal requirements, and you must still ensure that the requirements of the National Environment Protection Act Act or NEPA are met. For example, in some previous declarations, applicants dump the snow into the Hudson River. That is prohibited by environmental laws and regulations. If you're moving snow in conjunction with an eligible emergency protective measure, make sure that you're not placing the snow where it will impact on any environmentally sensitive or protected areas. If you're not certain how to proceed, Please ask for guidance before you act. If you're dumping or staging snow, you must provide, provide the GPS coordinates of that location. Historic sites require consultation with the SHPO and FIPO as appropriate. Please keep in mind that historic sites are not limited to building type structures. There may be other facilities that have historical significance. Any structure that is 45 years or older must be reviewed by SHPO and sometimes by FIPO before repairs can be made. Keep in mind, keep that in mind should there be damages to an historic facility as failure to comply may result in loss of funds and potential penalties that could cost you as the applicant dearly. If there is repeating, the applicant should seek appropriate guidance before proceeding. FEMA is prohibited from duplicating benefits, so FEMA deducts all other sources of funding used for the scope of work on your project from your FEMA grant. The most common additional funding source is insurance. However, any other source such as federal or state grants and monetary contributions from any source, public or private, must also be deducted. The Public Assistance Program also imposes a mandatory obtain and maintain insurance provision on all insurable damages that exceed $5,000. Failure to comply with this provision will jeopardize FEMA funding and render the facility ineligible for public assistance in the future. Proof of compliance will be required prior to the project closeout. The final tier of eligibility is eligible costs. These include the cost of your own employees, equipment, materials, and supplies purchased or taken from stock and properly to perform eligible work. Management costs are those costs applicants incur for the administrative work performed to submit their public assistance projects to FEMA. We will discuss management costs later in this presentation. FEMA will review every project to ensure the work performed is reasonable and necessary to address disaster-related damages and will apply the appropriate deductions for any funding received for the same work from other sources such as insurance proceeds. For the applicant's employees, their salary or hourly rate plus fringe rates are reimbursable for hours spent performing eligible work. FEMA may require the applicant to provide a fringe rate for both regular and overtime rates for their employees. For emergency work, the applicant's budgeted employee costs are generally eligible only for overtime while engaged in eligible emergency work. Both straight time and overtime is eligible for the applicant's temporary employees performing eligible emergency work. Force account equipment is equipment you own, purchase, or lease, which is used for eligible work. Equipment is generally reimbursed based on hours of usage. FEMA gives credit for a full workday if the equipment is used for half the regular workday or more. For example, a Department of Public Works driver drives a truck with a trailer and loader to a project site and then uses the loader to work at the project for five hours, loads it back on the trailer and back drives back to the DPW yard. The truck and trailer are only credited with the actual hours in transit to and from the project site, but the loader that was used for five hours can be credited for a full workday since it was used for more than half the workday. FEMA cost codes establish hourly equipment rates for leased or rented equipment. Reimbursement is based on the rental lease agreement when it is necessary to purchase equipment to perform eligible work, FEMA re may reimburse the purchase price minus the salvage value 
or the applicant can simply claim the hourly usage on that equipment. When salting and sanding are approved, cost codes can be adjusted to account for the salting and sanding equipment. Force account materials such as road flares, emergency blankets, or ration are those you use from your stock or purchase from the eligible project. If you use materials from stock, you can document the cost by using invoices, if available, or obtain free quotes from local vendors to establish the replacement costs. You do not have to replace the materials taken from stock you used on your FEMA project before claiming reimbursement for those materials. Donated resources are labor, material, and or equipment donated by a third party. For emergency work, category B, the value of the donated resources can be credited to the total combined local share of all the applicant's emergency work projects. For example, the applicant has five emergency work projects totaling $500,000. The total local share of the five projects would be $125,000. If the applicant assumes the entire local share, the applicant can claim up to $125,000 in donated resources. All purchases and contracts must meet all local, state, and federal procurement requirements. Please pay particular attention to mandatory contract provisions identified in 2 CFR Part 200, Appendix 2. If some procurement procedures are suspended due to an emergency declaration, FEMA will require the applicant to justify the scope and duration of the suspension. FEMA reviews purchases and contracts for compliance, so make certain your documentation is in order. As stated on the last slide, all contracts must meet local, state, and federal procurement requirement. FEMA will review all contracts for compliance. If the contract is found to be non-compliant, FEMA may deny the project. Competitively bid contracts with a fixed cost and well-defined scope of work are preferred. Applicants who use mutual aid will have to comply with the provisions of those mutual aid agreements. If the applicants do not call for reimbursement to the provider, FEMA will not reimburse for mutual aid, but the applicant may be able to use the aid provided as donated resources. If the agreements do call for reimbursement to the providing entity, the entity must bill the applicant for eligible costs, who will then pay the provider and submit those costs to FEMA for reimbursement. If mutual aid resources are deployed to assist but do not get utilized to perform eligible work, no costs are eligible, including the costs for mobilization and demobilization. Lump sum contracts are acceptable and easy to monitor as they do not require the applicant to document the quantities used. Time and material contracts can be used but require additional control measures. They must be reasonable and contain a cap as to not to exceed 200 to exceed 70 hours of work which the contractor violates at their own risk. The idea behind time and materials contracts is to allow the applicant to respond quickly to an emergency. For scopes of work that will be performed over a longer period, applicants are expected to comply with normal procedures and procure contracts. Be aware of types of contracts that may jeopardize reimbursement. A cost plus percentage of cost contract is where a contractor says they will do the work for whatever it costs them plus a percentage of that cost. For example, the contractor spends 100,000 on the work and the percentage agreed is on is 15%. The contractor receives 115,000. In this type contract, there is no incentive for the contractor to work efficiently and swiftly. The more costs they incur, the larger the profit. This is an ineligible contract and FEMA may make your project ineligible if you use it. Don't refer to FEMA reimbursement in your contracts. Making a contract contingent on reimbursement from FEMA will make it ineligible for reimbursement from FEMA. And finally, do not contract with a debarred contractor. Federal procurement regulations have a requirement to actively solicit minority and women-owned business enterprises. The requirement does not mean simply putting a notice in the newspapers as part of your bid process. For example, language in the publication that says, MWBE enterprises are encouraged to reply, does not satisfy the requirement to actively solicit them. You need to identify MWBE contractors in your area and show active solicitation. 
via email, telephone contact, or regular mail and invite them to bid on your project. Failure to do so, do so may make your project ineligible. Next, we will discuss Category Z projects. FEMA will reimburse an applicant's direct and indirect administrative costs incurred for submitting and processing its FEMA projects. Reimbursement is based on actual documented administrative costs and is capped at 5% of the total of your obligated projects. Please submit your streamlined project applications for Category Z management costs in Grants Portal. Applicants must submit full documentation of management costs. The federal share on CASI projects is 100%, subject to the 5% cap based on the total obligated projects. The management cost policy is contained in FEMA's Interim Policy 104-11-2, Public Assistance Management Cost Interim, and FEMA's Public Assistant Management Cost Standard Operating Procedures. There is also guidance on the process available in the Resources section of Grants Portal. This slide shows some of the eligible management costs. Please begin capturing your administrative costs, including the cost incurred to attend today's applicant briefing. You will need to document your administrative costs before requesting closeout and reimbursement for your CAT-Z project. Reimbursement can only be claimed for management costs incurred during the app applicant's authorized CAT-Z period of performance, which is defined by whichever of the following occurs first. 180 days after the, after the applicant completes its last non-management cost project, or 180 days after the latest performance period of the applicant's non-management cost project, or two years from the date of the emergency declaration. Currently, the project completion period of performance deadlines for CAT-C projects in Grants Portal and EMI may be inconsistent and generally incorrect. You must use the period of performance criteria just discussed to understand when the deadline for submitting your CASI project for closeout is triggered. DISHES must submit its recommendation on the applicant's CASI closeout to FEMA within 180 days of the expiration of the applicant's CASI period of performance. So applicants should submit all their CASI closeout documentation to DISHES within 90 days of their CASI period of performance. Over the past several years, FEMA has been refining the process by which it delivers the public assistance program, and we will discuss some of these steps in a moment. This slide shows the steps using FEMA's Grants Manager Grants Portal systems. Grants Manager is the FEMA side of the system, and Grants Portal is the applicant side. For EM3590, there may be a few, if any, site visits required. There are four phases of the PA projects under the FEMA's delivery model. Each phase contains multiple steps. The process begins with damage assessments immediately after an incident occurs and culminates with project obligation, completion, and We are now in phase one at the applicant briefing. To participate in a FEMA disaster recovery, applicants must establish a grants portal account. Grants Portal is the applicant side of the database where the FEMA projects are now developed. It replaced FEMA's old database, which was called EMI. Many applicants have established Grants Portal accounts as a result of participating in the COVID-19 declaration. All projects and documentation are now submitted through Grants Portal. Once an RPA is approved, you can proceed with the recovery scoping meeting and start to formulate projects in Grants Portal. Currently, projects are still obligated in FEMA's old database known as EMI, but that functionality will migrate to Grants Portal in the near future. For emergency work, CAP-B, Emergency Protective Measures, there is a streamlined application format in Grants Portal for applicants to utilize. If you have not participated in a recent disaster declaration, you may find that the titles for various roles have changed and FEMA's delivery model now incorporates consolidated resource centers where much project development is coordinated. In any event, DISHES will assign Disaster Assistance Representatives, or DARS, to all applicants to assist you with your recovery. There are various elements of a project that will be necessary to develop in order to process your projects. 
It is an important thing to remember to thoroughly document all the information to support your project. This includes an applicant's decision making process, invoices, contracts, insurance policies, claims and settlements, actual costs, personnel policies, procurement docu documentation, proof of payment, permit application and responses, etc. If you do not provide the required documentation, FEMA may issue a request for information or RFI and withhold a reimbursement until you comply. DISH's representatives will be available to assist applicants with developing their projects. You must provide a complete list of all your damages to FEMA within 60 days of the recovery scoping meeting. Grants Portal will automatically lock the applicant's damage inventory list after 60 days, and FEMA has discretion to deny any damages identified after that deadline. This slide lists the normal site inspection process. Site inspections are not required for completed work. If there are damages that require a site inspection, FEMA site inspectors will inspect those damages. These inspections may be in-person or virtual, depending on circumstances. Therefore, it is important that you capture all the necessary information to document your damages to include photographs, GPS locations, quantities and dimensions, site access issues, environmental or historic preservation issues, and mitigation opportunities. The site inspection results in a site inspection report. Make certain that the site inspection report fully and accurately captured all relevant damage information. FEMA has several consolidated resource centers located throughout the country. Disaster declarations for New York have been handled primarily by the CRC East in Virginia or the CRC Atlantic in Puerto Rico. CRC operations are divided up by lanes based on the type of projects they handle. FEMA will accept an estimate provided by an applicant that contains the necessary detail as shown on the slide. FEMA may request additional information if the information provided is insufficient to them to validate the estimate. FEMA establishes project thresholds for each disaster. You must meet a minimum monetary threshold for an alert, alert eligible project. In order to qualify, a project must have eligible costs of at least 3,800. All projects are then categorized as either a small project or a large project. Small projects are those under a million dollars and large projects are those at or over a million dollars. Let's discuss some differences between small projects and large projects and the requirements for each. Small projects are obligated and paid based on the approved cost estimate. Once approved, small projects are generally not amended to reflect changes in actual cost unless the applicant successfully appeals for a small project reconciliation. Applicants must promptly submit the completed P4 form to the dam as soon as the work is completed to trigger closeout of a small project. Large projects, on the other hand, must be paid based on actual costs. So they require a formal accounting process for closeout where appropriate, applicants may request progress payments for the portion of the work on a large project that is already completed and fully documented, including necessary permits and proofs of payment. Applicants must promptly submit the completed P4 form to the dam as soon as all the work on the large project is complete to trigger the large project final accounting process. At that point, DISH's personnel will coordinate with the applicant to review all supporting documentation for the project and make a recommendation to FEMA regarding final payment and closure on the large project. Also, applicants are required to submit quarterly progress reports or QPRs on their large projects as long as the projects remain open. The disaster assistance manager will prompt you to submit this report each quarter. Dishes will also provide additional briefings to applicants that specifically address QPR and closeout requirements. There are several standard items that FEMA typically deems necessary to support most projects. When you're working on developing your projects, make sure you have the necessary documentation. Again, we cannot stress enough the importance of documenting all of your actions and costs in support of your projects. Failure to do so will jeopardize your FEMA funding. 
The recovery transition meeting provides an opportunity for the applicant to review their projects and FEMA and DISH's field personnel in order to make sure that all the eligible work undertaken has been captured in one or more projects and submitted in Brown's portal. It is at this point that you will be transitioned to the DISH's disaster assistance manager, who will then be your primary point of contact for any further actions that may be necessary, including scope of work change requests, quarterly reports, time extension requests, and closeouts. When FEMA obligates your project, you will receive a project obligation notification from the disaster assistance manager in the form of an email with attachments. It will include a copy of your approved project and the P4 form you will use to certify project completion. Please make sure you promptly return to this form as soon as your project is complete so DISHES can submit it to FEMA and have the project closed in the system. Receipt of the project application notification email also starts a 60-day clock for the appeal, so please review the approved versions of your projects promptly and closely when you receive the notification and make sure everything is in order. If it's not, please contact the Disaster Assistance Manager immediately. All projects must be closed. For small projects, no formal accounting is required, but the applicant must submit the signed P4 project completion form to the Disaster Assistance Manager immediately and when the project is complete. Please track your projects carefully and submit the P4 as soon as each project is completed. For large projects, submitting the P4 triggers a formal accounting process. The applicant must submit the signed P4 immediately upon completion of a large project and be prepared to provide all supporting documentation for the project. Please coordinate with your disaster assistance manager and manager projects to ensure compliance. DISHES will offer additional briefings to applicants focused on the quarterly progress reporting and closeout process. The work completion date is the date an applicant physically completes the authorized scope of work. Once an applicant completes the authorized scope of work, they must promptly submit the project to DISHES for closeout by submitting the signed P4 form to the Disaster Assistance Manager for EM 3590 Bernadette Moran. Delay in completing the closeout process may jeopardize your FEMA funding. FEMA imposes deadlines for submission of supporting documentation required to close a project out. Applicants have 90 days following the completion of their project to submit all required supporting documentation to DISHES. Failure to provide the documentation within the required period will likely result in loss of funding. So please make sure that you're tracking your projects and comply with these requirements. If you have questions at any time, please contact the Disaster Assistance Manager immediately. An applicant may appeal any FEMA determination. You have 60 days from FEMA's transmission of the determination, such as the project obligation notification, or a FEMA determination letter or memorandum to submit an appeal on that determination. This 60 day deadline is for submit, submitting your complete appeal package to DISHES, not just a notice of intent to appeal. We have an appeal team at DISHES who will assist you in developing your appeal upon request. The small project reconciliation is a particular type of appeal. If you find that the estimate or cost of your small project combines were insufficient, you may file an appeal for reconciliation. You must file the appeal within 60 days of completing your last small project. FEMA would then review your actual cost on all of your small projects. If there is a net cost overrun on all of your small projects combined, FEMA will obligate the additional funds. However, if it is found that you have a net underrun, FEMA may deobligate the overpayment. For this reason, applicants contemplating a request for a small project reconciliation are strongly encouraged to contact the disaster assistance manager to request assistance. FEMA may transmit a determination memorandum on letter via any method that confirms receipt, such as the PA grants manager grants portal, certified or return receipt mail, or an email with a, receipt, re, with a read receipt acknowledgement. There are two levels of appeal within the FEMA Public Assistance Program. The first level of appeal is to the FEMA Regional Administrator, which in our case is Region 2, with offices in New York City. 
The second level of appeal is available if the first appeal is unsuccess unsuccessful, and it goes to the FEMA Deputy Administrator for Recovery in Washington, D.C. An applicant can elect to go to arbitration in lieu of a second appeal if certain criteria are met. Please discuss this option with the DISH's appeals team if you're interested. While the applicant can elect to have legal counsel and expert witnesses in arbitration, those costs are not reimbursable. Here are some pitfalls to avoid. Please make sure that you follow all the procedures, guidelines, and regulations. And as we have said through this presentation, if you're not sure of something, raise a question to your disaster assistance manager and get an answer before you proceed. FEMA grants are subject to audit by both the New York State Office of the Inspector General and the DHS Office of the Inspector General. You must be able to produce the backup documentation on all your projects should you be audited. The documentation uploaded into the grants portal does not meet this requirement. You must maintain a complete file in your office on each of your projects. So what's next? You will need a grants portal account. Submit your request for public assistance so DISHES can create your account for you and you can be approved as an applicant in EM3590. FEMA's project template is now available in Grants Portal. You can start compiling your emergency work projects using those templates. FEMA's state personnel will be assigned to assist you in the development of all your projects. Here is DISH's office contact information if you have questions. And this last slide contains some additional resources for you to consider should you need more information on the recovery process. And I am now turning this over to Jamie Marcella regarding the Small Business Administration. Thank you. Um, as Trish said, my name is Jamie Marcella. I am with the Individual Assistance section here at DISHES. I am going to be talking to you about the Small Business Administration. Um, as you can see on your slide, there are two different programs that counties could potentially move towards for um, aid for their um, impacted residents. The first one is the Physical Disaster Loan Program. Uh, these loans cover home and building repair and replacement of physical assets damaged in the disaster. Eligible applicants for this would be homeowners, renters, businesses, and nonprofits. There is a threshold that needs to be met um, if a county can get to get a declaration for this program that is 25 or more homes and or businesses. So it can be a combination of both with 40% or more uninsured loss of the estimated fair replacement value. So what does that mean? Um, so for anyone that has insurance, if they have additional uh, impact to their homes that is 40% or more and uninsured, that can be an eligible um, damage line. This program must be requested within 60 days from the date of the disaster. There is also the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, this is geared towards businesses. This loan program must be requested within 120 days of the disaster. Um, to receive this declaration, we would need at least five businesses in the disaster area who have, subs who have suffered substantial economic injury and need financial assistance not otherwise available. Uh, substantial economic injury is defined as the business no longer being able to meet its obligations and pay its ordinary and necessary operating expenses. Um, you all should have received from the Watch Center last month. Um, it is a spreadsheet that includes uh, all damages that can be documented. Um, it also includes a one-pager on the Small Business Administration program. If any county is looking to move forward with this, they feel that there are enough residential and business impacts in their county to make this request, they will need to fill out this document in its entirety including that fair market value of each home. Um, that can be filled out either by having your local tax assessor uh, identify that information, or you can simply look at different realtor sites to gather the information necessary. 
You'll need to include a damage description of each of the homes and or businesses, um, providing enough information that it proves to us that there is um, an eligible damage level. Um, please make sure you try to capture as many of those damages as possible. Um, once we receive that information back, I will make a request to the SBA to have in-person assessments done. That would include an individual from the Small Business Administration, someone from um, the individual assistance section, and someone from the county who would need to then show everyone around to each of those identified damages. At the end of that assessment, uh, the, the SBA will provide a report to the state detailing if the county has met the threshold or not. If so, the state will then make a declaration request um, for that county. If that county does meet the threshold, all contiguous counties would be eligible for that program. And then I think we are opening it up to questions and I will pass it over to Jim. Thank you, Jamie. While I uh, take a look in our chat box, I invite uh, others to enter their questions there. And I, uh, I will uh, turn this over for the answering of questions to uh, other panelists in the room, if you'd like to introduce yourself while I get the uh, chat box open. Yeah, this is Joe Calarapi on the Public Assistance Spectrum case. And I have Joe Stinson, my deputy uh, for the administration unit. And we will be taking your questions. Um, I can answer the question I see right on the bottom from Shannon. So Shannon, that is correct. The counties would be applying for the Small Business Administration. Um, however, they're doing it on behalf of trying to get this program open for their residents in their county. Um, if you guys uh, are a county that has a tribal nation, um, that tribal nation can either make that request themselves or um, my office is happy to facilitate that as well. Um, if that is the case and the tribal nation is in your county, you can combine your damage level to reach that 25 or more homes and or business threshold. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, the first question up I see, can you please tell me the proper way to add a plow that was loaned out to another municipality? We plan to only include the equipment hours. The other municipality will include the overtime hours worked by their employee. It is Joe Kalarapi. If the applicant that performs the work must claim the expense. If uh, you loan that plow to another municipality that uses it, you, they, you have to have some type of agreement between them as a municipality uh, for the expense of the plow. So if you're charging that municipality for X hours for the use of the plow, you will present an invoice to that municipality. They will pay you for that. And then it, they will claim that on their FEMA project. Thank you. Next question. Can you provide guidance on labor rates to apply for CERT volunteers at CERT that staffed shelters? If you have volunteer labor, which will be a donated resource, FEMA establishes a labor rate. I believe at this point, it's somewhere around $30 an hour, $30.50 an hour. Next question, what is RPA approval? Your request for public assistance is submitted to FEMA. FEMA then reviews that uh, request to determine whether you as an applicant are eligible under the FEMA public assistance program. If they are, they determine that you are uh, eligible, they will approve that RPA and then you can establish your portal account and submit any eligible work projects. If they determine that you are not eligible, they will provide a memorandum uh, that the decision memorandum that says why you're not eligible and you will have the opportunity to appeal if you so. Okay, next question on eligibility. So Niagara County is not eligible? At this point, only two counties were included in the declaration. We are currently pursuing the addition of other counties. Niagara is one of those counties. Uh, and as soon as we get a uh, decision from FEMA, we will 
publish that information and add the counties that they approve. Will the slides be available for review after the presentation? The slides are currently on the district. Okay, we will provide them after this presentation. Next question has to do with applicants already approved for another disaster. Do they have to provide this information again since it's already in Grants Portal? They do. They have to apply for every. They have to apply for every disaster. They do not have to provide information that's already in the portal, but they have to provide and submit an RPM. All right. Is snow blowing to clear access to hospital property covered? No, not unless you have an otherwise eligible emergency protective measure that required that snow blow. If the counties and towns are reporting Cat B only, they still have to meet or exceed the threshold, correct? No, there is no threshold for an emergency declaration. Thresholds are applied to a major declaration. This is a Cat B event, so only overtime labor is eligible. But if Cat C damages occurred, do straight time labor costs apply? If the uh, for Cat B, you can only claim overtime labor. However, if there is a uh, a cost that is for damages that occurred as a result of the disaster, they can be added to the Cat B budget. Next two questions concern snow removal. What if the employees were performing snow removal? And the next one, I would assume if you can show snow blowing was over and above what you normally do, it may be eligible. Snow removal is not eligible in this emergency declaration because we did not get declared for snow assistance. It is FEMA's contention at this point, the snow assistance is only available in major declaration. We are currently in the process of negotiating that and trying to appeal that decision. Are straight time and overtime labor costs eligible for EOC costs? This activity is not part of the employee's normal duties. For Budgeted employees only overtime is eligible. However, if the applicant hired a temporary employee to either do the EOC work or hired a temporary employee to backfill the budgetary budgeted employee who was performing eligible EOC work, those costs will be eligible uh, for regular time. This next one I'll direct towards Jamie for individual assistance but only the counties can apply for this, correct? Yeah, so the counties would be the ones that are submitting their damages um, on behalf of the residents. Once the declaration is made, it is the residents, uh, homeowners, renters, or businesses that can apply for the potential loan program. Thank you. We have multiple divisions, for example, airport, police force, metro rail, can we enter each entity as a separate project? You would have to enter each uh, organization separately. Uh, you can, if, if you want them to be separate applicants, but if they are under your umbrella and you have legal responsibility, you can enter projects on behalf of those entities and they can be separate projects for each individual one under the applicant. As long as that applicant has legal responsibility for the subordinate uh, organization. Would towing contract costs be eligible as part of snow assistance under a potential major disaster declaration? Those costs would only be eligible if necessary to perform uh, eligible uh, emergency procedures and then under a snow declaration if they need to tow vehicles to do the plowing and snow removal they could be eligible, but FEMA will want to make sure that uh, the applicant has properly billed, if possible, the owner of the vehicle. Next question comes from Dutchess County. 
We deploy DPW equipment and employees and also public safety dispatchers to Erie County from Dutchess County. How will that work? And that's mutual assistance. So we'll have to look under what uh, mutual assistance agreement that was conducted. The way it normally works is that the county providing the services uh, provides the invoice to the county receiving the services, who will then pay that uh, providing county, and it's the county receiving the services who will submit the project to FEMA. Okay, next question. If a county provided staffing assistance to Erie County, do we provide all the documentation to them? You would have to provide the necessary documentation to support your cost. You would provide an invoice and a breakdown of all that cost. So if you're providing personnel, for example, you would have to provide the personnel, the employee's name, you'd have to provide the employee's uh, rate, position, uh, fringe rates, all the costs that uh, you are going to be billing the receiving county for that particular report. Next, more eligibility. Will Orleans County be considered for any reimbursement? Thought I heard only Genesee and Erie counties. Again, only Genesee and Erie County were declared in the emergency declaration. However, we are in the process of requesting additional counties be added. How do you establish snow removal costs for emergency response when you had power outages and cars on every road? Does full opening of all roads count? Is there only a 48, 48 hour window allowed? No, the 48 hour window applies to snow removal and it's only applicable if we get snow assistance. When we're talking about uh, snow removal in conjunction with an other eligible protective measure, the applicant must clearly identify that protective measure and then only those snow removal activities necessary to perform that measure would be eligible. If we're talking about plowing to remove cars, no, that's not eligible. If we're talking about plowing to reach a stranded motorist in the car, yes, that would be safety and rescue. Is salt being covered? No, unless we get snow assistance, in which case Salt and Sandy would be eligible during that 48. Is the Small Business Administration information available on the DISH's website? It is not currently posted, but I will make sure that it does. Thank you. There's a partial question. If plow equipment entered private property while... Well, uh, private property... Uh, work is not normally eligible uh, unless there is a need to protect the public and safety. Uh, so if it's doing work on private property, uh, that is not an eligible expense. If you're saying that that uh, plow caused damage to uh, private property, uh, that would have to be looked at very carefully to see whether or not uh, FEMA would even cover that. Is there a labor rate for New York State, Erie County volunteer firefighters? Can the hours be submitted as a total or do you need to list every individual firefighter and hours? You would have to list each individual in the firefighter. You would have to list the hours, the dates. You would have to list what they did. If we're talking about a donated labor rate, there is a standard rate that they can apply to everyone. Or if they have a different rate because they have paid fire uh, individuals uh, in that same area, they can use that rate if it's better. I believe the standard labor rate right now is $30.58. So therefore local volunteer fire departments are eligible. Local fire, yes. Local fire, volunteer fire departments are eligible PMPs, but they must be performing eligible work in order to work. In what case is straight time an eligible reimbursable cost for category B work? If you are hiring individuals, temporary individuals to do eligible work, or you're hiring those individuals to backfill an individual, a budgetary employee who is doing eligible work, then those costs, those straight time would be eligible. 
How long does approval typically take? Still waiting for the November storm approval. Are we talking about approval of RPAs? If that's the issue, uh, there are some programmatic issues that need to be addressed uh, at the higher levels. And until those are addressed and signed, FEMA cannot move forward to approve uh, the RPAs. We hope to get that resolved shortly. Thank you. We had in-house overtime hours as well as contracted labor and equipment to clear snow for patient and employee access to our hospitals. Are those expenses eligible? No, those expenses are snow removal and they would only be eligible if we get snow assistance. How to facilitate reimbursement for costs incurred during our sheltering event? We are a fire district. Had volunteers staffing our two halls for approximately two days, 24 hours per day. If volunteers are not paid, so those would be donated resources. And shelter costs are only going to be uh, eligible if they were, in fact, utilized and meet that minimum $3,800 uh, threshold. Who is best to talk about help with Grants Portal? I attempted to set up the profile for my organization, but was denied because the organization is already in the system. FEMA tech support said it's because there is not a POC associated with our profile and to talk to dishes for assistance. I left several messages and awaiting a return call. That Trish? That, that would be Trish Devely. So contact uh, Trish Devely. Uh, we have to put up the slide with them. The information on there, please. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So contact Trish and she'll be able to help you through that. Are there any requirements for prevailing wages? The applicants normal uh, Personnel and labor policies would be what would be fine. Our facilities damage at a university included damage to scientific equipment and office equipment from water from broken pipes. Would these damages be included with the documentation for the facilities damage item? They would if they were caused by the event. And keep in mind that FEMA is going to look for the insurance policy and will deduct any insurance proceeds. If a fire hall was used as a shelter but was not considered as a county shelter, can this be submitted? It can if it was utilized and then you have to determine who the eligible applicant would be. Could be the fire district, could be the town, could be the county, but it could be eligible. If it was utilized, then again, the project meets the minimum threshold for a project of $3,800. If a building were in imminent danger of collapse and the applicant had provided the immediate precautionary measures to relieve the snow, would that be an eligible cost? Yes, if again, the collapse of the building is due to the snow and not to other factors such as the building uh, about to fall uh, because of lack of maintenance. Any facility that's going to be claimed as damaged has to be in use and it has to be maintained. What is the state or county threshold to receive 75% FEMA reimbursement? The 75% has nothing to do with the threshold. Uh, in this case, for the EM, there is no threshold. So simply an eligible project uh, would be funded by FEMA at 75%. And the 25% at this point is on the applicant. For snow removal required to open access to a hospital, would that qualify as an emergency measure? No, because it's snow removal and snow removal is only authorized in an emergency declaration if it is directly tied to an otherwise eligible emergency protective measure. If mutual aid is provided to Erie County and the City of Buffalo, 
through the EOC and New York Responds, who should support documents be submitted to? Again, well, we're going to look to determine how that's going to work, but normally the providing entity provides all the documentation, the, uh, an invoice and supporting documentation to the receiving entity, who then will use that to submit a project. But it's also possible that the state might be the applicant. In that case, we haven't determined that. Is New York State trying to get the snow assistance connected to this event? We are trying to get a major declaration connected to this event, which will include snow assistance. But keep in mind that snow assistance is tied to snow of record. So if we don't achieve snow of record, the snow assistance will not be granted by King. Will the application deadline date change if and when Orleans or any other county get included? It could change, correct. And it looks like our final question here is the 3,800, I'm assuming dollars, is the 3,800 minimum for shelter use and overall total, or is there a 3,800 minimum per facility? It's a $3,800 minimum per project. So it needs to come up to that minimum level in eligible work for each submitted project. Multiple costs can be submitted on one project. Okay, we have one other question. If we were removing the snow and hauling to a new area, can we still submit a rough estimate of how much was removed, even though there are no images of the area and the snow has melted? You're going to have to have some type of documentation. If, and again, those costs would only be eligible if we get snow assistance. If we get snow assistance, FEMA is going to want to know uh, how many truckloads, what was the size of the truckload, where did you take it from, where did you bring it to, uh, and capture that information. From the town of Grand Island, would not a blizzard be considered a, a snow emergency when hurricane type winds and snowfall exceed two to six feet? Not necessarily. Snow emergencies uh, and snow assistance is based on snow of record. So if you're talking about Erie County, the snow of record in Erie County is almost eight feet. So unless they exceed that, they would not qualify on their own. They could qualify under the contiguous criteria. So for example, if Niagara County were to meet their snow record and have 40 inches of snow, Erie County, which is contiguous to uh, Niagara, if they had 40 inches of snow, they would be considered as qualifying for snow assistance. So related to that, when will the snow assistance approval or disapproval be made? Well, for the major disaster that we're trying to get now, we expect the National Weather Service and FEMA to provide snow totals or official snow totals on the 15th of January. For the previous snowstorm and the inclusion of snow assistance in emergency declarations, that would be a process that's going to take some time as it will require FEMA headquarters to review and make a decision based on the appeal we are submitting. That's the last uh, question I see in our chat box. Um, and this is Joseph, and I do see one other comment here um, uh, addressed to anyone in Erie County. Please continue to send information as requested as we're working closely with federal representatives on the declaration of scanning information for that purposes. I would just extend that to everyone on the call. Please continue to submit your costs, even if that, uh, uh, according to what you heard today, they may not be eligible. We want to collect them so we can scrutinize them. And if uh, FEMA makes any modifications to the current declaration or grants the major um, uh, declaration, then potentially costs that aren't eligible today may become eligible. So please help us continue to gather those costs. Yes, and we've asked everyone out there and uh, the district folks are certainly working with applicants in these counties to capture these costs in an effort to substantiate 
of the damage levels and try to reach the major declaration of 35.7 million. Uh, so we would like to get that information as quickly as possible. We set a deadline of the 11th, January 11th, to get that. Uh, we ask you to separate your cost, snow assistance cost, snow removal on one side, and all other eligible costs on the other, so we can do an evaluation of those. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we'll try to get uh, as much as we can for a major deck. And if we can get that, that will alleviate some of these issues. And for any county looking to move forward with a small business administration request, uh, please note the deadline to submit those damages is January 25th. So I'll make sure those documents are updated on the DISH's website. And I will also make sure that it's sent out through your county regional directors. Anybody else? I don't see any other uh, comments. I'd like no to... other questions? Okay, well, we thank you for your time. We certainly appreciate it. We know that uh, you're very busy out there uh, handling uh, a myriad of uh, emergency situations. Uh, and uh, uh, we know we're, we're asking for, for you to, to do some extra work here. And we want you to know we appreciate it. And we're going to try to do everything that we can to provide you as much assistance and as much financial aid as we possibly can. So thank you for your time. Uh, and we'll be talking to you. Well, that wraps up our question and answer portion of the program. And we'll conclude our presentation. On behalf of everyone here at Issues, I would like to thank you for joining us today and invite you to visit our website for updated information and to download a copy of this presentation when it becomes available. Again, have a great day.